I want to talk to you about what is easily my favorite programming language, JavaScript. And uh, I want to give you some sense of where it came from, what it's for, how to write and run programs in it, and just to give you a really quick overview of the language. And I'm going to I'm going to do this today from the perspective of you who have been, you know, learning C and C++ and you've been learning other C style, uh, uh, curly bracket style languages. And I wanted to look at JavaScript from the perspective of someone who's also learning those languages and so on. Now, I assume that some of you have done work in JavaScript before and others of you have never touched it. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go through a bunch of the basics. But what I will also say is that even if you've looked at JavaScript before, JavaScript tends to be not well understood by a lot of the people who use it. So many people never learned JavaScript and it's a problem for them because the language has evolved rapidly. It's grown all kinds of new features and syntax and if you've never really seriously learned JavaScript, this is the time to do it, to really get a, get a handle on the language and become a, a good practitioner of the web and web development and JavaScript development. Okay, so in the notes for this week, uh, we have a section on JavaScript and really it's just a, a light introduction to get you started. We're gonna begin in earnest next week talking about functions and um, writing a bunch of code. But for now, I just wanna talk about uh, at the highest level, what is this language? So the first thing that I want you to be aware of is the fact that, uh, and I think I have a note about it in the, uh, in the notes in here today, you're going to hear references. Let me just try and find this. Uh, where is it? Anyway, I'll, I'll come back to it. You're going to hear people refer to JavaScript, but they're also going to refer to ECMAScript. So I have the ECMAScript web page up here. And ECMAScript, or ES, and JavaScript, or JS, are synonymous. They are the same thing. So ECMAScript is the standard that is maintained. So JavaScript is an open source language. It's It's been standardized. And the, the standard is maintained by ECMA. So they're the standards body who, who maintains this language. And there are all sorts of different editions of the ECMAScript standard. So if you go and you look this up on Wikipedia, ECMAScript, you'll see that there are the fourth edition, the fifth edition, the sixth edition, which came out in 2015, the seventh edition in 2016, and the current edition, the 11th edition of the ECMAScript standard came out in 2020. So you're gonna hear people refer to these names or when you're reading about things on the web, you'll, you'll see people say that they are using ECMAScript 5, or they're using ES6, ECMAScript 6, or they're using ECMAScript 2016. And you're like, what on earth is this? Because you know, you're learning JavaScript and you're learning to program JavaScript. So what is this other thing? So when you hear that, what they mean is the particular version of JavaScript that you're using adheres to the standard that was written at whatever you know edition they are referring to. So in this course, we're gonna do a lot of our work. We're gonna use ES5 and ES6. And I will sometimes throw in some of the more modern pieces. What happens with JavaScript is that implementers, so these are browser vendors or others who implement JavaScript, and there's quite a few different implementations of JavaScript, they slowly add these features and so you have to be careful about using really, really modern features, things that are in later editions of the standard, like the 11th edition, which just came out in June, may not be implemented in all browsers. And so we have to wait or we have to use tools to get around those limitations. So I just wanted to mention this to you because you will hear people refer to ES and ECMAScript and so on, and it can be confusing because, you know, when you're expecting to find JavaScript and people are talking about ES, that's what it is. So another confusion that people have is that the name makes it sound like Java. And there's a famous quote, Jeremy Keith from 2009, he said, Java is to JavaScript as ham is to hamster. And 
the, the the Java part of JavaScript is really a marketing thing. So when JavaScript was originally released uh, out of Netscape and they needed to name this thing, at the time, the hottest language in the world was Java. So this is in the mid 90s and Java was, was gonna solve the world's problems. Um, with Java, you were gonna be able to write your code once and run it everywhere on every device, run it in the browser, run it in the server and so on. And ironically, that has actually been what JavaScript has done. JavaScript is really this code that we write once and then we run everywhere. We run it in the browser, we run it on web servers, we run it on devices. So when you see Java, don't be confused. If you've done any work in Java or you're going to be, uh, we have courses that you're gonna be taking later on Java, you'll, you'll learn about Java and these languages are not the same. So they really don't have anything in common with each other other than some surface level um, syntax and um, both supporting things like object oriented, but they're very, very different language. So JavaScript was designed to look familiar to people who know curly bracket style languages. So that's C, C++, Java. It was designed to be easy to learn for people who know those languages. So the language looks a lot like C or C++ or Java when you look at the initial syntax. However, it has more in common with some very different styles of languages, for example, Scheme or Lisp or some functional programming languages, and it borrows a lot of ideas from these other languages. So there are aspects of JavaScript that are really unique and different than any other language that you will work on. So for example, we're gonna learn about the way it does uh, object-oriented prototype in uh, using prototypes for its inheritance model. Very, very different from the classical object-oriented model that you're going to learn in C++ and Java. So it is a, it's a multi-paradigm programming language, much in the same way that C++ is. You can program JavaScript in different styles. So you can use an imperative style and do like structural programming like you would do in C. You can do object-oriented programming like you would in Java or C++, and you can also do functional programming, language, functional programming which is um, one of the strengths of JavaScript is, is the way that it treats functions, and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this, and I'll, so, I'll say a little bit more about it in a minute. So JavaScript has also become, ironically, a compilation target for other languages. So, Every device, every computer in the world runs JavaScript. And as a result of that, if you want to get code to run on a particular machine, well, one way to do it is to turn your program into JavaScript. And if you can make your program into JavaScript, then you can probably run it anywhere. And so this, the, fact, the ubiquity of uh, JavaScript in the world has meant that people have written compilers they're a funny kind of compiler known as a transpiler, a compiler that takes source code in one language and turns it into another language. So taking, um, taking Python or taking Java or taking something and turning it into JavaScript. So a really uh, popular example of this right now is TypeScript. And you'll be learning TypeScript later on. You may already have heard of it. So TypeScript is a programming language that is similar to JavaScript, but um, makes some very different design decisions. However, when you compile a TypeScript program, you produce JavaScript. So JavaScript is a programming language that has many different paradigms that you can use, but it also, other programming languages compile into JavaScript in order to run. So when you run a JavaScript program, what you're gonna do is you can't run JavaScript on bare metal. So it's not like writing C or C++ that's meant for building native applications. And in this way, it doesn't really replace C or C++ or other um, programming languages that target native or where you want to write very low level code. JavaScript's meant to be embedded inside of an environment. So for example, that could be a web page running in a browser. There's lots of different um, Essentially, you're embedding a JavaScript runtime inside of another program, and then you're able to uh, write JavaScript that targets that environment. So we'll spend a lot of time about looking at this. So you don't compile your JavaScript program in order to run it. However, JavaScript does get compiled, 
but it gets compiled by the runtime. So when you run your code in a browser, your program starts off being interpreted and the interpreter uh, runs your code without a compilation step. However, as the code gets running and the browser starts to understand where the code is spending a lot of its time, there are what are called just-in-time compilers or JITs, which will compile that code and make it run uh, at near native speeds. Um, there are all kinds of JavaScript engines to, that are available, both in browsers and uh, on the command line and running in various devices and so on. And it has led to um, what's, been, what's been dubbed Atwood's Law. So um, today, Atwood's Law is that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. And so what he's talking about is the fact that JavaScript may not be the world's best programming language for all purposes. However, uh, it is available everywhere, it is fast, and it is highly productive. And so as a result, anything that you can write in JavaScript, people tend to do it because um, it's so easy to install, it's so easy to distribute, it runs on everything, it works cross-device, uh, cross cross-platform, um, cross, cross platform, et cetera. So JavaScript is um, perhaps the most popular programming language in the world. So I have a, a chart here for you. So this is um, every quarter, Redmonk does a, um, an analysis of programming languages, and it puts on the y-axis the popularity of that programming language on Stack Overflow based on the number of tags, and on the uh, x-axis, we have the popularity of that programming language on GitHub, the number of projects that are using it. And JavaScript has for a long time been at the intersection of both of those. So you can see JavaScript way, way up here in the top right corner. JavaScript is incredibly popular, lots of people learning it, lots of people talking about it, and lots of people doing productive things in it, building big applications in it, building libraries and frameworks and doing all sorts of commercial and other types of work. You see it here, we've got Java, Python, C++ is in here, TypeScript is here. So that's interesting, like JavaScript and TypeScript, they're both JavaScript as it were. And so you can see other programming languages along. Here's CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript is another programming language that compiles into JavaScript. So JavaScript is incredibly popular. It is available everywhere. It runs on everything. And one of the reasons that it's popular too is that it's fast. So I said a minute ago that JavaScript isn't as fast as C and C++, and that's true. C and C++ are definitely going to be, um, or languages like Rust, are going to be the best choice if performance is the absolute most important thing that you're doing or if you're doing really super low level work and you need to interface directly with hardware, you're not gonna write, for example, device drivers in JavaScript. However, for programs that aren't like that, which is much of what happens in the business world, what we do on the web, what we do in education, video games, all sorts of things, don't actually need a lot of what we're talking about when we need to reach for a language like C++ or Rust or something else. So, because JavaScript is a standard, so nobody owns JavaScript, it means that lots of different companies have implemented their own version of JavaScript. So for example, um, the V8 JavaScript engine, I'll just pull up the website here. This is not, <laughs> that is not the one that I want. Google's V8 engine is here. V8 is the implementation of JavaScript that Google uses. So it's written in C++ and it is incredibly fast. And so it's one of half a dozen of the main, Apple has one, uh, Mozilla has one, etc. All of these different JavaScript engines are available. And these, because they there are so many of them and because these companies have been competing with each other, they have competed not on features because the features are already specified in the standards. So Google doesn't get to decide what JavaScript does or doesn't do. What they do is they implement this standard. What they can do is they can differentiate themselves by making their implementation faster. 
or use less memory or so there's been a, an arms race of trying to get faster and faster JavaScript implementations. And the benefit to us as web developers is that the entire JavaScript ecosystem has become such that you can write JavaScript code that will run uh, through these just-in-time in compilers, these JIT compilers, it will run basically at the same speed as most native code once it gets going. So that's tremendous. And um, the language the language has evolved so, so much since it came out in the mid-90s. And today, you can, do, you can do everything with it. You can do anything with it. Okay, so let me let me switch tracks a little bit and let's let's have a quick tour of the language. So um, the first thing that I, I really need to do is we need to write our very first program in uh, in JavaScript. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that now. Let me switch my view. So the very first program that you have to write in every language is obviously hello world. So let's write hello world. So in JavaScript, hello world looks like this, console.log hello world. And I'll save that. So this program can't be run as is. I can't just go and run it at the command line. And if we were writing this program in C or C++, the first thing we would have to do is we would have to compile this program. Well, with JavaScript, we don't have to compile it, but we do have to run it inside of a JavaScript engine. And so I'm going to show you a number of ways that we could do this. So the first way I'm going to show you how to do this is I'm going to run it at the command line. And I'm going to use Node.js to do this. So I told you a second ago about the V8 engine. V8 is is Google's implementation of the ECMAScript standard. So this is Google's version of JavaScript. And the V8 engine, when I talk about it as an engine, you can think about an engine. I could take the engine out of a car and I could put it in another car. And that's exactly what they've done with their JavaScript engine. So they took it out of Chrome, out of Chromium, and they made it available as a standalone thing. So here we have Node.js, which we've talked about in other videos. So if you've installed Node.js, it means that you can run JavaScript programs at the command line. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type node and then I'm gonna put the name of my file which is hello world.js and I'll run that. And it does exactly what you would expect it to do. It runs that program, hello world. So this JavaScript program here that I have had to be run inside of a JavaScript runtime. The runtime interpreted my JavaScript code, so it parsed it and it, it was able to execute that within an environment. So the environment that I'm currently running in is the node environment. Now let me show you a second way that we could run this because a lot of times when you think about JavaScript, you think about the web. So what would it take to run this program on the web? I'm gonna write another, I'm gonna make another file I'm gonna make a, an index.html file. So this is a simple HTML file. I'm not gonna make a complete HTML file. I'm gonna cheat and I'm only gonna put in the part of an HTML file that's necessary to run JavaScript. So I'm gonna put in a script tag. The source defines the file that is going to be included with this script and I'm gonna run my hello world JS. I'm gonna close my script tag. So this is a very, very basic HTML page, which is going to load my JavaScript file into the browser environment. Okay, so I'm gonna save this and let's try running it. So over here, I'm gonna open up a file and the file that I want is in my web, let me, th let me get this here, this is, uh, all here it is index.html i'm going to open this and there's my web page and it looks like nothing has happened because i don't have any content in my web page but what i do have if i right click on this and i go to the inspector and i open up the dev tools 
So here's my dev tools. The second tab in is the console, okay? So here on the console, you can see that it says, hello world. And you can see over here on the right that this came from hello world.js line one. If I click on this, it shows me my code. This is the code that was executed. So in both cases, you can see that my program has run. I've got the program running in Node, and I've got the program running in the browser. So the same code works in both environments. So JavaScript is an, is an embedded programming language. You run your code inside an environment. It could be in a web browser environment. It could be in a command line environment. It could be in lots and lots of different, there's lots of different embedding um, places that you could do this. So this is what I did in order to write some JavaScript and um, execute it. I wrote a file and then I ran it using Node or in the browser by wrapping it in a script tag. What else could I do? So when you're learning JavaScript, uh, another thing that you're gonna wanna reach for all the time is you're gonna wanna reach for what's known as uh, a REPL. So this is a run uh, eval print loop. So a REPL is a way for us to it's almost like having a JavaScript command line, like being able to, instead of writing bash scripts or um, you know working at the terminal with your operating system, being able to program directly against JavaScript. So the way that I drop into a REPL for working with JavaScript, I have two options. If I'm on the command line, what I can do is I can just type node. So notice that the first time I did this, I gave the name of a file. The second time that I do this, I'm not gonna give a file name. I'm just gonna type node. And when I do that, I get dropped into like another kind of command line. The prompt has changed and it says, welcome to node.js. So in here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say console.log hello world and press enter. And you can see that the code that I wrote has been displayed inside of the REPL. So it has run my code, it has parsed it, it has evaluated my code, it has printed the result and it's looped around to do it again. So that's what a REPL is. Your browser also has a REPL. So over here, you can see it, this exact same command line uh, prompt that we have inside the node REPL. I have it here inside of my browser. So if I type console.log hello world and I press enter, it prints out hello world inside my browser. So now you have a whole bunch of different ways to try these things out. Whenever you're in the REPL, it's, it's a place where you can type a line of JavaScript and have it executed. And you're gonna see me do it all the time. It's a really powerful way to test out ideas. When you're learning JavaScript, it's almost like having scrap paper. You know, you're doing a big math problem and you want to test if something works. You're just gonna jump into a REPL, either in your browser or over here. And you can, you can get this REPL on any page you're on. So here I am, for example, on the JavaScript notes for this week. If I right click, go to inspect, go to the console, I could start typing I could start typing and executing code directly inside this page, any web page. And we're gonna do a lot of that as we go on, okay? So I want you to be aware of the, the fact that we have these REPLs available to us for you when you're trying to um, work on your code. Okay, so that's hello world. Now, let me give you a really quick tour of the language and talk to you about some of the main features of this language. So the first thing that I want you to know is that semicolons in JavaScript are optional. So that program there will work. And I'll prove it to you if I were to run this program, there's no problem. So whether you include the semicolon here or you don't, the program will work. However, if you leave semicolons off in JavaScript, you are at the mercy of the JavaScript runtime. So when it parses your program, it will do automatic semicolon insertion. So in other words, semicolons are actually required. However, you don't have to put them in. You can let JavaScript do it for you. So my advice to you is 
there are parts of JavaScript which are just um, where you could make a choice. And every language has this. You could choose to do semicolons or not. And you'll read on the web, some people will tell you don't do semicolons. My advice to you as a programmer who's been programming for a very long time in many languages is put the semicolons in and do it because other programming languages that you're working in right now require them. You have to do them in C++ and Java and other places. So as a result of it, I would say just get in the habit of doing them and you won't have to think so hard when you're switching between languages, which you're going to have to do a lot of this term. So I'm going to put... Uh, I'm gonna put semicolons in. Okay, so comments. You saw me put a comment right here. So a lot of things that you're used to in um, C and C++ work here as well. So if I wanted to have a single line comment, I can do that. I could put it here. I could put it above, below, whatever I want. And I can also do multi-line comments. So um, if I wanna have multiple lines of comments and this goes without saying, but because I mark so much student code, I'm going to mention it. And that is that you should get in the habit of writing comments. You should make sure that your code is clear for the person who's going to receive it. So that might be you in a week's time or a month's time, or it might be some other employee at a company. You want to try and make sure that people understand what your code does. I wouldn't put comments here. I wouldn't do that because it's obvious from the code, but a lot of times our code isn't obvious because it includes ideas that are hard to understand unless you know what the algorithm is or how the data is being used. Okay, lots and lots of things that you know how to do from C and C++ work exactly the same way here. So, you know, if you wanted to check if um, X, is equal to seven, then do, do some series of steps, right? We could do something like that. So there's lots of things that you're gonna be used to, things like for loops and while loops and switch statements and all sorts of things that um, I have in the notes here. I think I've got examples of most of them down at the bottom. Um, you can go and have a look at these and I'll, I'll just talk about some of the ways that these are different. Uh, and I won't go into all of them, but I, I wanted to just make this point that you can leverage a lot of the things that you know about from working with C and C++ when you're moving into JavaScript. And what you're going to have to do is pay attention to the things that work differently. And there's quite a few things that are different. So we'll talk about this. One of the big differences with JavaScript that you're going to you're going to run into is that uh, functions are very different. So the way that you define a function, for example, if I wanted to um, define a function that says um, "Hello World," I would do it like that. That's how you define a function using the function keyword, but we're going to learn that functions, you can do some really interesting things with functions and functions are the most important building block for JavaScript. So functions can be passed to functions, functions can be stored in variables, functions can be returned from functions. So the way that you would use an integer uh, in C, that's how you'll use a function in uh, in JavaScript. They're just, they're everywhere. And where other languages like C++ will use classes or Java will use classes as a major building block for what you're going to, you're going to work with. When you're working in JavaScript, you're going to tend to use functions. Functions are this essential unit of code that we're going to be focused on using. Okay. Um, this language is going to feel very weird when you first get started at it because the language doesn't have static types. So I brought along a program here that I took from the notes, um, the C, C notes, um, and this is calculating the area of a circle and, and then printing it out in C. So I want you to notice a number of things about how this, how this code is written. 
we are defining all kinds of types. So we're saying that our main function returns an integer. We're saying that pi is a floating point number. We're saying that radius is a floating point number. Area is a floating point number. So in JavaScript, the way that we work with data is different. So JavaScript is a weakly typed language. It is a runtime typed language, or another word that we'll, you'll hear a lot is, it is a dynamically typed language. So all of these things, what they mean is that JavaScript has types, but the types aren't known until runtime. So let me try it. Let's, let's try and make sense of this. So here's a program, um, a C program. So if I wanted to compile and run this program, I would compile this program area.c and let's spit out area. So what's happened in that step is that the compiler has looked at this code and has said, all right, I understand that the type of this number is, is, is float, this number is float and so on. If we changed something in here, um, if the compiler was un unhappy with us, it would come back and it would give us some sort of an error or a warning. You know, for example, it says, you got to be careful here because you are assuming that you have a double precision floating point number, but the argument has a type int. So what we have here is we have a, we have a static or we have a compile time check. So the compiler reads the code and it makes a whole accounting of how everything should work. So we haven't run the program yet uh, to see what happens. Like, what if I actually run this program? If I run this program, I get this bonkers answer. So my program runs, but it doesn't do what I would expect it to do. And the compiler is telling me, you're gonna have a problem here because the way that this is being interpreted is not the way that you're defining your data. So if I change this back and I recompile my code, and I rerun my code, I get what I expect. I get the area that I expect. So there's something interesting happening here with a statically typed, strongly typed language like C++. C++ is very, very careful about the types that you're using. And part of that reason for that is that C++ is meant to be run for very low level code. You're, you're interacting more directly with the machine. You're working with memory directly. You're doing a lot of things that are potentially very, very dangerous. And you have to be super careful about how you do it. JavaScript isn't like that. So what JavaScript does is it allows us to declare data, but the data is not going to be known. The type of the data is not gonna be known until the program is run. So it's a runtime language and the types can change at runtime. So how how would we uh, how would we write this program in JavaScript? Well, the first thing I would do. Let me just copy this over into my JavaScript file. Okay, so here's my. Here's my program. If I was going to define a function in JavaScript, the first thing I would do is I would say function main. Now, JavaScript doesn't have a main function as such. So in C or C++, I'm saying main, and this is this main is a special function, which is going to be the entry point for my program. JavaScript doesn't have anything like that. If I wanted main to be run, I would have to run main like so. I would have to call the main function. I would have to invoke it. So another thing I might decide to do is not even have a function. But I want you to notice something. I'm not saying int. I'm not giving a return type. JavaScript functions can return values and often do return values. In fact, they always return some value, even if that value is undefined but I don't define it. And you'll see that I also am not specifying anything in here for the type that I'm accepting. Whereas in my C program, it's saying explicitly that I want to have void here. So I'm just going to get rid of this function completely because I don't actually need it. So here, what we have is we say const pi equals this number 3.14. In JavaScript, I have a couple of ways that I could do this. So the the simplest way to define a variable is to use the var keyword. 
So I declare a variable and then I would say pi equals 3.14159, like that. So this is gonna feel really, really loose. It's gonna feel like something's missing and, or you're gonna feel, I, one of two things is gonna happen. Either you're gonna feel more comfortable with this or you're gonna feel really uncomfortable with it. So if, you're, if you've really started to embrace the idea of a statically typed language like C++, then this is gonna feel wrong. Like where is my, where's my type here? Um, how come I'm not specifying that this is a float? I don't need to because what's gonna happen is JavaScript is going to inspect this value at runtime and it's going to say, okay, the type of this is what's known in JavaScript as a number. So numbers in JavaScript are 64-bit double precision uh, floating point numbers. Every number in JavaScript is a 64-bit double float. So we're not gonna worry about unsigned integers versus floats versus 16-bit integers versus bytes. We don't have that distinction. We just have number. Four point two. So if I was going to rewrite the 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 first the declarations of this function, I would do it like this. Now you're also going to see people writing their code using a variety of different keywords for defining variables depending on the version of JavaScript that they're working with. So the more so the older versions of JavaScript only used var. And var has some problems with it. So in the more recent editions of ECMAScript, they introduced let and const. And I'm going to suggest to you that probably the best thing for you to do as someone who is also programming in C++ is I would just use let everywhere, let or const everywhere and not use var. But I wanna show you var because you're gonna see people using it in their code, especially older code. So if I wanted to, I could change this to let, let, and let. And I could actually do the same thing that we're doing up here. This is a const, it's not gonna change. So I could, if I wanted to say, this is a const. So I could write my code like this. I could actually make this a const too if it's not gonna change. Now, I'm not gonna get into using const a lot. I don't think const is as important in JavaScript as it might be in some other languages. So what I'm gonna suggest to you is that let is probably the right choice most of the time for the code that you're gonna write. Area equals pi times radius times radius. Semicolons are optional, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put one in like this. How do we print this out? Console.log and the equivalent of what's happening here. So this string interpolation that you're seeing right here can be done a number of ways. So the way that I would write this is I would use string interpolation like this using back ticks. I would say area equals um, area like so. And that would do the equivalent of what's happening above. So there's, there's the equivalent of the same program that we're, we're working on. So talking about working with data types, every Every type that you're gonna, the, everything has a type, but there's only a very few types. So let's just look at them. We've already seen number. These are numbers. This is a string and strings are Unicode. So um, there is no character type. You don't have arrays of characters but um, you have full Unicode. So this can be, this isn't limited to ASCII. You can put in Japanese, you can put in emojis, you can put, so this is gonna support the full range of characters that you can have in any language. So we have numbers and we have strings. We also have Boolean values. 
true and false. So these are, so instead of using zero or one as you would in some languages, you're gonna use true and false in JavaScript to be able to refer to things that are true or false. And we also uh, have lots of things that are of type object. So I'm not gonna get into all of those today, but we have numbers, strings, booleans, and then tons and tons of things are objects. So a good example of an object is console. Console is an object. So objects are used for arrays, for dates, for functions, for all sorts of things. And whenever we have something that is an object, we have a, a reference. So O here, O is, O is a reference to an object. So JavaScript doesn't allow for us to do pointers and doesn't allow for us to do raw memory addresses like you can in other languages. So those are powerful features that you need if you're working with native code, but incredibly dangerous. And every kind of security hole or crash that you have in C and C++ programs almost in inevitably comes from misusing uh, pointer, direct pointer memory access. And so it's a dangerous thing to do. JavaScript doesn't allow us to do it. It still has the idea of a pointer, but these are almost what you would, you could think of them as like safe pointers. The ability for me to declare some memory and then get a reference to it, get a pointer to it, but, uh, but, but not have access to, so for example, if I said O2 is equal to O, what I've done now is both O and O2 refer to the same object that lives in memory. So we'll, we'll talk a lot about this later on. Uh, what else do we have? We have string, we have numbers, strings, booleans, objects. And then we have a number of um, sort of empty types. So for example, let n equals null, we have null. And we also have something called undefined. Um, so if you don't define a value, so for example, you can see here that we have let area, the value, the current value of area is undefined. The current value of U2 is undefined. And when something is undefined, it literally means that it has never received a value. It's never been defined with a type. However, when we say that something is null, what we're saying is that it has a type and the type is nothing. The type is null. So you're gonna see both undefined and null used in JavaScript. And one of them means, has it ever been defined? And the other one means it's been defined to nothing. So we have both of these, both of these to contend with. Okay, so what are some other interesting aspects of of JavaScript that we should talk about before we, you know, before we, we, we pause on this. Another thing that's really interesting about JavaScript is I talked to you about true and false values, but JavaScript also has this concept of truthy and falsy values, truthy and falsy. So in addition to things being true or false, we also talk about things being truthy or falsy. So JavaScript will take an expression where it expects a, a pure Boolean and it will, it will use it as a Boolean. It will evaluate it as a Boolean. Let me see if I can give you some examples here. I'm gonna go into the inspector. I'm gonna go to the console and um, in, in, uh, in a language like, uh, well, you could do this in C and C++ too, but if I have some value, like if I say that um, let x equals true, if I, do, if I get the value of x, the value of x is true. And if I say that, um, if I were to evaluate the in, you know, the if I said not x, I would get false. 
And if I said not not x, I would get back whatever the pure Boolean value of this is. So what, whatever x, uh, whatever the value of x is. So let me give you some examples of, of things that are uh, truthy. So if I say x, we've, we've seen true and we've seen false. If I said x equals 42, if I said not not x, that evaluates to true, or I could say not not 42 and it gives me true. Um, I could say not not negative 42. So negative 42 and 42 are both truthy. They're not Boolean true values, okay? They are truthy values. If I said not not zero, I get false. So zero is considered a falsy value. Um, what about this? If I said not not true, true is a string, is true. What about this? So if a string is non-empty, that means that it is truthy. So there's, we're gonna run into a lot of this. Um, as you get going on this, you're gonna see lots of code where we're gonna do, let me give you an example. So if I say let s equals some string, I can say if s, then do something. If s, what does if s mean? If s means if s is truthy. So is the is string true or false? It's true. What if the string was the empty string? What would happen then? So if I if I test that, if I do the empty string, I get false. So if I had the empty string, this would never this code would never execute. Um, what if I had null? Null is falsy. So it, this is what we, you're gonna see a lot of JavaScript that does this type of thing where it checks to see if a value is truthy or falsy. And so because JavaScript is this dynamic language where the types can change, like for example, I can say x equals 10, and then I can say x equals 10, and there's no problem. Now the, <laughs> there might be a problem for you. You might look at this and say, this is a catastrophe. How can I have a programming language where one, in one part of my code, x is a string, and in another part of my code, x is a number? And we could also say x equals 10 point whatever. And so now it equals this, or, you know, th this is gonna feel really, really slippery, but there's another way to look at it. There's another way to look at this, and that is that you have a language which is incredibly flexible. It's really dynamic. So it allows you to break all kinds of rules that you would not be allowed to break in other languages. However, there are ways to do this safely. There are ways to program JavaScript and work with data, um, allowing the type to change at runtime and not have your program blow up on you all the time. So that's we're gonna learn how to do this. We're gonna talk a lot about it. Okay, so in addition to talking about things being truthy or falsy, I also wanna introduce another um, I want to introduce another way of dealing with um, equality. So you're going to be used to doing things like this. If x is equal to 7, so that's a problem, right? Like if you wrote that code in, in C, what does it do? Well, here you've got this weird assignment happening, and so we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We would say if x equal equals 7, so we want to differentiate equals, so equal is the assignment, equal equal is to compare these values. JavaScript also supports equal equal, so you can do this. But JavaScript has another one, equal equal equal, which is strict equal. So let me show you the difference. One equals equals one is true. 1 equal equal 2 is false. Makes sense, right? How about this? 1 equal equal 1. How do you feel about that? The string 1 equals the number 1. So when you use equal equal to do comparisons in JavaScript, what's going to happen is it is sometimes going to do an implicit cast to make the type of the left and right hand sides of this 
match each other. So it's going to convert one or the other of these into the same type. So you're going to end up comparing two strings or two numbers. So how do I get around this? False. So if I put three equal signs, sometimes called three equal or strict equal, what I'm saying is, I'm saying do the types of these two match and then do the values of these two match. So my advice to you is that in JavaScript, just always use equal, 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 rather than equal, equal. And we have the same thing with not equal. So if we could, we would say if X is not equal to seven, right? In JavaScript, I want you to say not equal, equal. So we have strict equal and strict not equal when you're uh, when you're working with comparisons in this way. This one will take a little bit of getting used to. So this idea of truthy and um, working with strict equals and so on. I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a lot of time doing this. You're gonna see me doing it. It's gonna feel weird, but it has to do with the fact that. JavaScript is more flexible than other languages in the way that it allows data in certain places. So the data can, you can have a number or a Boolean or a string or all sorts of things, an object. And so we need ways to be able to, to write our code that would work for all of them. Okay, so what else should we mention briefly before we, we wrap up here? Um, another aspect of JavaScript that makes it incredibly productive is that JavaScript is a uh, JavaScript is a, a garbage collected language. So where in C and C++, you have to do manual bookkeeping of your memory. So it's really easy, for example, for you to allocate memory on the heap, and then you have to take care of freeing that memory sometime later so that you don't leak. You have to make sure that the memory that you create before you use it, you zero it out or you set values so you don't have garbage in it. There's a lot of manual work to do things with memory. In JavaScript, we don't allocate memory manually. And we also don't have to free that memory man manually. So the garbage collector will do just what it sounds like. It will collect all of the garbage that's in memory and it will free it up for you automatically. So when something goes out of scope, when you create a large amount of data and it goes out of scope, if nothing is holding a reference to that anymore, nobody is using that anymore, the garbage collector, collector, when it runs, it will free up that memory. So it doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen automatically. It may never happen. If the computer doesn't need to, if it has enough memory and it doesn't need any more memory, then it may not run the garbage collector. But the garbage collector will manage all of this for you. This leads to much safer code. So even if you are a professional C++ programmer, you're still gonna make these errors where you use memory after you free it. And this is where all kinds of security bugs come from. People forgetting to do this. It's very, very, very difficult to get this right. In fact, it's 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 impossible to get it 100% right. So um, languages like JavaScript make it so that you don't have to do it at all. So this is, a, this is an aspect of JavaScript that I think you're really gonna like. It's gonna free you up to think about other parts of your program and you're not gonna have to do so much boilerplate and you're not gonna have so much stress about trying to figure out where um, you need to free memory, allocate memory and so on. It's just gonna happen automatically. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about is that JavaScript doesn't have a, um, a standard library like you notice in this C program you know we imported stdio.h um, and languages like Java and others have huge huge standard libraries so you learn the language you learn about the keywords and all of those things and then you start then to use those languages you have to start learning about the standard library so JavaScript is, is odd in this way. It doesn't come with it doesn't come with a standard library um, of functions and, and, and a lot of objects. Like it doesn't do a lot out of the box. 
So some people call this, when they think about a language, they'll say that, does the language have batteries included? You know, if you buy a toy at the store, does the toy come with the batteries it needs in order to run? Or do you have to go out and get those batteries yourself? JavaScript doesn't include a lot of batteries or doesn't include the batteries that you need in order to run it. However, people have, have made all kinds of, the, the lack of a standard library has forced people to create modules that they need. So remember a minute ago, I said to you that Atwood's law says that any application that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. So what that has meant is that people have written more code, more um, modules for JavaScript than any other programming language in history has for it. So here, this is a, a neat site, module counts, tracks the number of usable modules for all different languages for .NET, for PHP, for Perl, for Python, for um, Rust, for like all these different programming languages and for JavaScript. This blue line that you see right here that's going up, 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 up and it continues to go up, that's JavaScript. So JavaScript modules are published, not this isn't the only place, but a lot of them are published to NPM. And so if you ever need to do anything with JavaScript, you go to NPM and you can search and somebody will have written a library that does what you need to do. So a lot of times when you're writing code with JavaScript, you can go and you can take different pieces of JavaScript code that other people have written and you can bring them together and you can work with them that way. So we're gonna to use tons and tons of modules that other people have written. We're gonna write our own code and I'm gonna teach you really how this uh, language works. JavaScript isn't a, isn't a huge language. Learning JavaScript is much easier, for example, than learning C++. However, it has a lot of unique ideas that you won't encounter in other languages, and it's gonna take time. So my advice to you this week, as you get started, is I would encourage you to go and look at the readings that I've put up here. I've linked to chapters from a number of books online with introductions to JavaScript. Spend this week uh, getting all of your tools installed, Node, browsers, etc., Visual Studio Code, but then start reading about JavaScript because we're gonna dive into it heavily beginning next week, and I want you to start taking the knowledge that you have about C and C++ and moving it into um, becoming a web developer. Be patient with yourself. Learning another language takes time, uh, and this language is really worth learning. There are so, so, so many jobs that need JavaScript. And if you learn to use it well, you're gonna open up a lot of doors for yourself. So take what you're learning about C and C++ for low level application development, and then add to it what you're gonna learn about JavaScript for web development. You're gonna be a very, very powerful developer in terms of the kinds of things that you're gonna know. Okay, I'll pause there. And if you're looking for some uh, challenges to do at the bottom of the notes for this week, I've got some practice exercises here. You could try writing some code, just as I showed you here, writing the hello world to try and solve some of these problems and see how you do. Okay, I'll pause there. <laughs>